Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar on X-ray inline solutions for coil coatings. Presenting today is Freddie Binder, the Sales and Marketing Director for our Munich Inline Solutions. I'm Amanda Carter, one of X-Rite's North American Marketing Managers, and I will be moderating today's webinar. A few things before we get started. Due to the number of people that are attending today's webinar, we will keep everyone muted. During the webinar, if you have questions, please use the questions function in the GoToWebinar panel. We will have some time at the end to answer a few questions. If we don't get to yours, we will have someone follow up with you. And finally, this webinar will be recorded and you will receive a link so you can review the webinar at your convenience. I will now turn it over to Freddie. So hello and welcome at this seminar. Um, we want to talk today about the color uniformity in the production process, especially for coil coating. Um, let me start this seminar with two questions at the beginning. First question should be, why do we have to talk about color? What is the reason why is color so important? Well, the answer is that color is a primary quality criteria. If you look at that building, you can see that this building has two colors. Uh, maybe it's by design, but if you look at another picture of the building, you see this triangle over there, and this is for sure not made by design. The problem is everybody can see it, whether you are a male or a female, whether you are a color specialist or have nothing to do with color, everybody can see that there is something wrong. And this is the reason why I say color is a primary quality criteria. Everybody can see it and everybody has its expectations. If you do not like it, well, then you do not like it. It's, it's a bad sign for everybody. So second question, why do we have to measure color? If I say everybody can see the color, um, is there a reason to measure it? Well, this can be answered if you look at this. I show you this color swatch and try to remember that swatch. If I take it away and I show you just a few seconds later some more colors, which one was it? And you will see that it's no chance to, to recover, to, to remember what, which color it was. And even if I show you this color very close by, there are several colors which look quite similar. It's difficult to compare. The only thing what you can do is you can really move it along all the other colors and then you can see which color fits and which color does not fit. And you, you would have guessed number N, then it would be nice because this is the perfect color. So color is important. Why do we have to measure it in the process? What are we doing? If you look at this picture, this should be a typical company, a coil coating mill in this case. So we bring in the raw material. Maybe you make an incoming inspection with the quality control laboratory. Then you have a production machine where the coil is processed. You bring the color on top of it. And at the end, you make an outgoing control, so a QC measurement in the laboratory, and you say, okay, the coil is within specification, it can be shipped, or we have to reject it or rework it, whatever. Everything makes additional effort if it's not in spec. So the operator of the machine is a poor guy because he has no idea what he has to do. He is just running blind. He is working on the machine, and after a while, he gets a message from the laboratory whether the, whether the color is right or wrong. The better solution would be you place a color measurement right into the process, and the operator knows exactly where he is, so he can react immediately and put some screws, parameters, whatever, to stay in target. So this is the, the idea what we have. It's not that we compete against the laboratory. It's just a tool for the operator that he can run his machine and then the quality control laboratory at the end can prove that the quality is right and it can be shipped. So how to control the machine? Of course, one thing would be that you do it manually. So you put somebody on your coil and uh, try to measure it. But the question is, is this measurement really accurate? You see, if you have these small handheld units, and the moving coil, and the coil is moving maybe a little bit quick. Is the measurement really accurate? Can you really afford to put somebody on the coil coating machine to make these measurements? Is it allowed to touch the web during the production? And the last question, is it really enough information if from time to time somebody goes there? 
there could be anything in between which you cannot prove. So the much better solution would be that you measure in line the color and you can see exactly what's going on. So you have a screen in your operator's room and you get the color information right on time. You have not only at the beginning or at the end the information, all the process will be measured really from beginning to end and you can prove this to your customers. The workload of the operators is released because they do not have to go out. You can save time for that uh, by doing it automatically. And we have the color information also in cross direction. So what we do is we normally put the measurement instrument on a traversing beam to measure left side, middle side, and right side. This helps you quite well to adjust your nip press. Um, and last but not least, you can create a report for each reel. That means if you give it to your customer, um, you can prove how the quality was. It's also a kind of marketing tool to, to prove that you have done everything, everything well and the uh, color is right on spec. So this is a typical coil coating machine. So we have the unwinding at the left hand side and uh, then we have the cleaning process. We have the primary coater and the finish coater. And after the finish coater, after the oven, you have the water quench. And this is the place where we typically measure. Then the product goes just to the accumulator and to the roller. So this is a place where you immediately see if something changes over here. If you have a change, you can react. You can adjust your, as I said, your nip presses or whatever. And uh, this helps you to, to make a good quality during the time. What are the challenges for these inline measurement? Well, if you have a laboratory system, everything is quite nice. You have a, a laboratory which is normally even temperature controlled. So you have a nice temperature inside. The temperature is constant. It's not dusty over there. It's nicely protected everything. Um, and the sample can even touch the instrument, so you have no fluttering. Everything is nicely. So the laboratory systems are a little bit more easier to use. If you look at the production system, the product uh, at the production line, we have totally different conditions. When you start up the machine, the product is cold, the air is cold, then it's heating up quite quickly. Uh, during the day, if it's hot outside, you have different temperatures than in the night. So the temperatures changing frequently, we have to take care for that. Temperature changes are for all color measurement systems, the, I would say the enemy, you have to calibrate frequently. Then we have, of course, vibrations, uh, maybe even a static charge, um, which, which is influencing the measurement. The web is not touching the surface, of course, so we have a distance. If the web is fluttering, we need to have stable measurements, even at a certain fluttering of the web. And of course, the measured product is still hot, and we have to compare it to the room temperature which you have in the laboratory. So this is the big difference why we have to make a special instrument for inline measurement. If you look now at this ERX 145, it has a real 45 zero geometry. So it's insensitive uh, to sample rotation. Well, this has nothing to do with the inline now, but if you go for the laboratory later on, it helps you a lot. Um, but the 45 zero geometry helps you to have a stable measurement even if the web is fluttering. Because of this fluttering process, you have different angles compared from the web to the, to the instrument. So with a 45 annular, so it's a circumferential illumination, you have uh, a nice average, and even if the web is slightly fluttering, no influence on the measurements. We have a distance of 60 millimeters from the product to the, to the instrument, so it's a nice space in between. We measure the color from 330 to 730 nanometers, and even more critically, we measure this in one nanometer resolution. Why is this so important? Well, of course, if you have a higher resolution, you can measure bright colors uh, much more accurate. But I think the biggest advantage is that we have much more stable measurements because of this one nanometer. And I will show you this in the next slide. The secret is the calibration. If you calibrate an instrument, what does it mean? 
If you have here, we have here a green spectral curve, which has a reflectance of, let's say, 60%. If you make a white calibration, it tells you where are these 60%. So is it over here, or does it go up like here? So this is what every white calibration does. No matter if you talk about a laboratory system or an inland system, every system does it. But another question is, if you do the wavelength calibration, is this peak really at, in my case, 490 nanometers? Or is it maybe over here or over there? Where is this peak? So this can only be determined when you do a wavelength calibration. And this wavelength calibration can be done only with one nanometer resolution. That means if the instrument is on the machine and if the instrument is somehow shaked or moved or whatever, the measurements will change a little bit. But after each calibration, it will be brought back to zero because we do a white calibration and a wavelength calibration at the same time. And the ERX instruments are the only family which is doing this. So this is the reason why this instrument is very stable in short term, in long term, and even after service. So you have exactly the same values. This is what we want to measure, and this is what we get after the calibration. So, all together, if we do the right calibration, we have to adjust the 100% reflectance, which is done at every instrument, but also the wavelength calibration, which is done only with the ERX 145 instrument, to have a very stable and accurate measurement. Accurate not only for this one measurement head we have on the line, but also to the measurement head we have on the machine. Um, only both calibrations can guarantee a really good measurement on the machine and uh, in the laboratory. Okay, this is how the head looks like. And you see in front there is a ring mirror inside which is illuminating under 45 degree. We have a spot measurement of 30 nanometers and I said already the one nanometer optical resolution. We have the measurement distance of 60 millimeters, which, is a, which gives a nice clearance between the web and the instrument. We have a pyrometer over there to measure the surface temperature, and I'll show you later on why this is necessary. And of course, everything is protected by a glass pane against dust. And on the top, the instrument has some LEDs which give you a status of how this instrument is healthy, let's say. So if, if you have a problem and you have no connection to the computer, you can see directly on the instrument what's the problem. This is very helpful because especially these inline systems, they need to run uh, 24 hours, seven days a week. So if there is something people want to repair or want to, to get the, yeah, the solution fixed as quick as possible, so this is one of the many features we have in the software and in the, in the program itself to help you to get any problem solved quickly. Well, this was the instrument and this is how it looks at the machine. So if this is the coil, which is uh, on the machine, you see two rollers below. We have typically a linear track, a traversing beam, to measure left side, middle, right side. We have uh, a measurement system on one side, uh, the ERX 145, and if necessary, we can have a gloss flash on the other side. In the front, you see a calibration station. As I said, this instrument needs to be calibrated frequently because of these conditions we have on the production machine. So we move the instrument out, calibrate it automatically. The user has nothing to do with this. And then we continue with the measurement. And, no. Yeah. So, again, this is the sample holder. This is now the whole system, how it looks like. If this is set up at the machine, this is basically the picture we have seen before. Very close to the machine, there is an electric cabinet, which has all these controls inside to control the traversing beam and the instrument itself. Then we have a computer at the control room. So the control room is typic typically far away from the measurement place. You do not want to go up to the machine to see the measurements. So we have a second monitor at least at the control room to have a look and to control everything. Very often people in the color kitchen, they want to see the color as well because they need to know how to prepare the color, how to adjust the nip press, whatever. 
So they have a kit, uh, monitor over there, and if you have coatings from two sides, of course, we can have two coatings, uh, two monitors for each color kitchen. We have external signals. Very important is, uh, for example, the seam detection. If there is a seam, we move the instrument out that the coil seam can pass by and then we start again. But also meter counter is very interesting. Many, many different signals we have here. And what is very important, we can have an instrument in the laboratory to measure the standards in the laboratory. I'll show you later on why this could be very important. And we can have a connection to your host system. So if you have a system which tells uh, where you store all the measurement data or where you have all the production program running, we can connect to this system. And then we get the new jobs and we start our system automatically so that the operator does not even have to do anything with it. He just looks at the measured color values. So this is a kind of animation. This is how we measure. So we measure typically from one side to the other side, three spots, and then we go back in one shot and then we measure three spots again so that we have really the measurements left side, right side, uh, left side, middle side, right side. If you look at the, the picture, this is how it looks like. So this is an installation which we have made recently. We have here the ERX 145 instrument to measure the color. On the back side, you see the gloss flash, which is the measurement for the gloss on 60 degree. And at the back, you see this automatic calibration, sta calibration station. The calibration tiles are closed with a lid so that um, there is no dust on it. And when the instrument moves over, it opens to calibrate uh, the system. This is how the software looks like. So we have two different views. Some people like one view, some people like the other view. This is now a view where you see you have these uh, measurements left, middle, right on, on a diagram and you can see the last, whatever you set up, uh, 10, 20, 50 scans, whatever you want. And on the bottom, you see basically the profile of the measurement. You see on the left-hand side, the L value, last measurement and the measurement before, the A value and the B value. Or if you like it, we can have three screens or three graphs, let's say, where you have left side, middle side, right side. And by the way, what you see on the, on the uh, charts is on the top side, you see the light bars, light and gray bars. It's the L value. Below you see the A value, the B value, you have a delta E. And on the bottom, we have the gloss values. And so this is very easy to read. If you look at this, now we are a little bit too light. We are a little bit too green and a little bit too yellow. If we get reddish, then the bars change into a red color. And if we get bluish, the bars change into a blue color. So it's very easy to see where you are. I'm not sure, I hope you can see the video now. So this is how it works on the machine. So the instrument is moving along and while it's moving, we make these measurements. So there will be now the flash on the center side and it's going along to the, to the other side. So we do the measurement left, middle, right. And then the sensor recognizes that this is the end of the edge. We measure it, go back to the beginning, and we start the same process again. And you see on the back side is again these calibration table. So if we need to calibrate, the instrument just moves out by itself. The operator has nothing to do with it. We do the calibration and then we uh, we come back and uh, start measuring again. So this measurement is based or is typically after this water quench. So there the instrument or the, the coil is quite hot. So we have typically, uh, this is now in, in German uh, units, it's 50 degree, but it's quite hot, yeah. The, temp uh, the color could look different if you have um, a hot coil or if you have a coil at room temperature. This effect is called thermochromism. So you know this maybe if you have an iron on a, on a red t-shirt, uh, you see this spot of the iron and it changes, it goes away after time. So what do we do? We have the hot coil and we measure the hot coil, but what we want to know is how the coil looks like when we have room temperature. For this, we make a so-called thermochromism control. That means we measure the standard in the laboratory at different temperatures. 
And for this, we have this laboratory unit here on this uh, table with a heating plate on the bottom. So we see how the color changes at different temperatures. And then, I told you this ERX145 has also a pyrometer included. We measure the temperature on the line and recalculate how the color looks like at room temperature. And this is a very nice effect because um, with this you can really measure the hot coil and, and get the color values like you have in the laboratory. But to do so, you need, of course, instruments which have an excellent inter-instrument agreement because very often um, you have uh, limits of 0 0.2 or something like this in delta E. So if you want to achieve this, the instrument have to have a good absolute measurement to each other. This is a kind of calculation of return on investment. It's, it's based now in euros, but uh, euro and US dollar is not that far away, so you can see it's quite uh, nearly the same, I would say. If you can achieve 0.5% higher profit just due to quality improvements and uh, increased revenue, this would mean on a typical mill, ah, maybe I should tell you, this is uh, based on a, uh, on a mill which is making 13 tons, 13,000 uh, tons per month at 500 euros or US dollars per ton. So then you have 32,500 euros or US dollars. I think it's really not a big difference uh, which you can save per month. If you have 1% less waste, 13,000 US dollar. If you can save six hours manpower per month, which is not that much, 1,200 uh, US dollar uh, savings. Let's say you have operating cost of 500 US dollars that gets you to 400, uh, sorry, to 46,200 US dollar per month savings. So you can imagine the return on investment is quite quick. Then we have a very low cost of ownership. What you should do is you should make an external calibration. This should be done every four weeks and it takes approximately 15 minutes. The calibration itself takes only maybe 30 seconds, but okay, you have to pick up the standard, you have to go there, you have to place it, you have to press a button. So all in all, 15 minutes, this is not a lot. We recommend to have an annual maintenance, which is approximately 1,750 to 4,900 euros per year. That's an annual maintenance, it's also not that much. But therefore you have a reliability of much more than 99% and the typical life cycle of the ERX-145 is more than 10 years. So from my point of view, this is a really good investment. This was it from my side. Are there any questions? It looks like we have a couple questions, Freddie. One of them um, is the speed of the stripe and influence on the measurement. Um, no, the speed has no influence on the measurement. We have a flash lamp technology. That means we have a xenoflash inside. So it's like a camera. If you use a camera and you have a flash on it, every, everything stands still. Um, in the paper industry, we measure, we measure even up to 2,000 meters per second, which is approximately 6,000 uh, per minute, sorry, which is approximately 6,000 feet per minute. Um, so this is also very stable. With this flash lamp technology, we have no problem with the speed, for sure. Okay, is there an influence on uh, ambient light? Yes, uh, basically the same answer. This is the flash lamp technology. So the flash is much more intense than any ambient light which goes on. If the sun is shining on the product, if you lose a flash lamp lighting into the instrument, lighting into the uh, on the measurement spot, there is definitely no influence. One trick is also that we make a measurement right before we do the flash. So we measure the ambient light, and then we measure, of course, the flash. And the flash is the energy from the flash plus the ambient light. And we subtract the ambient light, and so we have only the flash. This is a technology which is widely used for any inline instruments to get rid of the ambient light, so it has no influence at all. Okay. For um, translucent paints, is it possible to make thermochromism control? On transparent paints, um, it is possible, 
because the color is measured, uh, not the, sorry, the temperature is measured with a pyrometer, so it's in the infrared area. And even if the paint for us is transparent, it's opaque for infrared radiation. So we can measure the temperature quite well, and then we can recalculate how the temperature, uh, how the color looks like at room temperature. This is also possible, of course. Is it possible to measure the color after the exit accumulator? Yeah, of course, it's also possible. Um, there is just one disadvantage. If you measure after the accumulator, you, it takes a longer time. And after the accumulator, you have not a constant um, speed, let's say, because you stop it to rewind it again. Um, so then in this case, we have to stop the measurement and the accumulator runs full. Uh, but as soon as the, 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 the web starts to move again, we start measuring again. Yeah, no problem at all. So some people do it, but typically we recommend to do it much earlier because then you do not have to wait until the, the whole product is running through the accumulator. All right, that was the last question that we have time for. So this marks the end of our webinar. Thank you for joining. If we weren't able to get to your question, we will follow up. Uh, you will also receive an email with a link to the recording of this webinar. So thanks again for joining us, everyone. Thank you, Freddie. Have a great day. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.